We are here at Connaught Brown with Shani Rees James to talk about her dramatic painting, The Significance of Red, and her particular interpretation of melancholia. Well, this, this exhibition is um, over about a year, I suppose, or two. Um, and every two or three years I do a London show. So I'll be working towards an exhibition to be showing in this gallery. And it's a product, really, of um, a culmination, really, of ideas that have taken place over the last four years, I suppose, which is this, as I said, interiors of, of women in houses, um, slightly obsessed about their interiors. And so there's a lot of still lives, etc. So. so it's a mixture of really a lot of the features of your work, the self-portraits, the flowers, the wallpaper the interiors all coming together and there's a lot, looking around there's a lot of red and a lot of black. Do you always use yourself as a subject? Well it's not really myself, it's more sort of psychological state of, of, of a person really, it's more the psychological state of me, um, but it's also every, in a sense, all women, I mean that sounds a cliche, but it is in a sense some um, different aspects of, um, of me I think really, um, but also of other women. It's, I'm more interested in the sort of psychological aspect of people and the idea of women in rooms and from that aspect. So I start off with myself and in a sense you could say loosely, loosely there is a sort of semblance to me, but really it's not me. It's kind of more the sort of internal state of mind of a but person. But you do work with the mirror, so when you're looking I in do. the mirror, what are yeah. you... What are you seeing? Are you seeing? Well, you see it in parts, you see. So it's also the painting aspect is the sort of to do with the physicality of the paint. I mean, I'm very interested in, you're working on a sort of, you're working on the abstract aspects of the paint and you're, you're kind of looking at the paint, paint sort of becoming something physical. So the paint is like becoming flesh, if you like. It's becoming, you know, a semblance of skin or flesh. Um, so I will start off with the mirror, but in the in this process of looking in the mirror, I'm also in a way looking in part so it's a trigger off, really. So with a head like, for example, these little heads, I regard them like almost like a landscape. Um, it's like looking at a figure in parts, and, and, and it is sort of looking, really, at the different lights and darks and the shades and all those sort of things. So it's, a sort of, it's very difficult to really pin down exactly what I do, because something like this, I will psychologically be thinking of a figure in a room and then all these flowers coming up to sort of swamp the figure. So that's the kind of thing, not so much, oh, it has to look like me, because, you know, I can look past myself, it doesn't matter if it's just a head. And do you have an idea of the composition before you start? Do you sketch it out? Do you know what it's going to look like? No, I have no idea often. I just go into it. I don't even do preparatory drawings, I just go straight into the painting. And um, in that kind of very quiet space of Wales, um, it's a very good way to sort of get into a concentration, a really sort of intense concentration of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then obviously you build up a lot of layers or the paint is very thick anyhow. Well often I destroy them, I maybe put them on the floor, put white spirit on, push it around and move it and see what happens and then see an element in it that I like. Because I'm sort of working on the abstract thing of the paint as well, so I'm working on the paint surface and what the paint's doing. I'm not really so bothered about whether it looks like somebody or who it is, it's just a way of getting into doing a painting with some kind of figure in it. So it's quite loose in a way, um, quite abstract really, I think. So that's very much related, I think, to the idea of a doll's house where you've got figures, women almost like they're like butterflies pinned against the wall, you know, they've got these, this thing about wallpaper and, and the idea of, you know, she's there but the flowers are in front of her and then the, the, the stylization of the flowers behind her so this kind of play if you like on what seemingly is meant to be beautiful and pretty like flowers but you know we cut them and they're put in a vase so there's a sort of a, a, a double meaning in a weird sort of way with flowers because it's almost like a woman in high heels isn't it it's like somebody going through torture to look like something so i think like why i like doing the flowers i don't know why because i'm not a flower painter as such but i just love that kind of luxuriousness of their shapes their abstract shapes and the way it can take over a whole canvas so it's not just restricted to something like in that one where there's no flowers what you've got is this sort of unwieldy type of vegetation so the vegetation in Wales is that, you know, all the flowers and the plants and everything that we've got is all wild because we're surrounded by five acres. 
So you're always thinking, oh God, the docks are growing down in the bottom field, or this is happening. And in a way, it's my take on, on the landscape, I think, because um, I grow a lot of the flowers, or they're wild, they just pick from the field. And um, it's just about the ungainly, uncontrollableness of nature, how in the countryside you're in a way all the time taming it, but you can't. So there's that sort of unruliness about the flowers that I like, really. Sort of anarchic spirits. You've also said before that you, you, you intend kind of for your paintings to upset the apple cart a little or to be disturbing. A little edginess, like a little like the scissors, scissors coming into that one over there. Um, and it's just, um, I, I don't think my work is necessarily pretty. I mean, I, you know, when I think of artists that I'm very interested in, people like Goya mm -hmm. and, you know, the black paintings, um, and in and in uh, Spanish painting, the dark is very much part of their culture, the duenda, the spirit. So going into that sort of psychological state or the dark side of, um, it's not a dark side, it's just motion, emotion. It's just, an, it's like a, 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 a sort of state of being. It's like something when something takes you over. And I think sometimes in painting it does do that. You know, your spirit is taken over by uh, you know, you, you sort of all language goes and all thought goes. You always want to get into a more lateral way of thinking. So, um, you know, they're, they're not necessarily um, pretty paintings. They're more to do with um, the figure being, you know, trapped or hemmed in or, um, you know, the symbolism of like the empty glass jar or um, I, don't, I don't read things into that, but other people come to it and they go, oh yes, empty glass jar and flowers and that. You know, I just do the things and they seem to have some kind of significance and then afterwards one can analyse all, you know. Also the red, I mean, you've mentioned the black and Goya, but the red is quite oppressive in a way. Well, the red is different in different cultures, you know, in different cultures you get red in China and it's very much a, a living life force. Um, you get red in, uh, a, a, you know, something like a, a Van Gogh, or you get red in, in something like a Francis Bacon, and it means something else. So it is often to do with vibrancy in life, living blood, you know. So there's all these associations with red, but it is a very strong, powerful colour, and I find that when I use it, it is invigorating, you know. It's um, something which is uh, quite interesting to f put the figures into that red. Uh, because you get a kind of a, the, the face and the, and, the, and the quality of the skin is related very much then to the red of the, of the background and it kind of has a, a singing quality sometimes. I mean, it's very intuitive often, you know, the way you paint, do a painting. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you kill it and sometimes it lives and you push it and then you make it, you know. But it's interesting because this whole idea, as I said, of containment, in a sense, in a gallery like this, you are containing something which is quite visceral. You know, it's suddenly in a different situation from a studio, which is very messy and covered in rubber gloves and all sorts of stuff. You're suddenly bringing it out and uh, putting on its best clothes, really. Um, I know that one word that is used a lot to describe your, your portraits in particular is melancholy. Sweet melancholy, I think. It's not really melancholy, it's more that kind of re um, reflective type of thing when you just are unguarded, you know, that's what the whole thing caught in the mirror, it's just a sort of unguarded thing. Um, I think in being brought up in the theatre, it was all so much to do with mask, if you like, and to do with putting on a face. And um, in a way, I'm sort of trying to do the opposite of that, so you sort of get underneath the mask and the figures actually stare at you, so you have a re hopefully a relationship with the painting as opposed to um, being a, a voyeur yourself. You are in a way confronted by pe people looking, somebody looking at you. No, I don't, a melancholy, it's a funny thing. I suppose we put on a smile, don't we? We're very mask-like, we're very terrified to show any feeling, and it's just really just a state of reflective thought, really. I don't. I think what got me into the idea of, of, of all these characters and, and the melancholy in the way that you're talking about is that being brought up in the theatre, and my parents had a theatre in Australia, they had a small intimate theatre, so I was watching from a very early age plays by Chekhov and Ibsen and Strindberg. Now all those plays deal with the kind of these psychologically 
frustrated women, if you like. They're at the turn of the century, they're educated, but they can't do anything with it because they are, the, in a way, the possession of their husband and they have no, no rights to any uh, property. So I've always been interested in that whole idea of that kind of traumatized, not traumatized, but a sort of woman who is in a way frustrated by circumstance because, you know, we still have the existence of that glass ceiling. It still is there. So we still, just by chance, we have sort of just a throwaway remark, like you do these strong paintings and you're a woman, even something like that, that is showing there is still a glass ceiling. You know, another gallery might say to me, oh, you know, and you've done these enormous paintings, the sort of thing you wouldn't expect a woman to do. So um, I realize there is this element of um, restriction, but because of this whole thing of being brought up in the theater and my mother doing these parts and my father, and everything, I, um, really always was interested in the theatre. I always wanted to do something myself with the theatre and finally, I couldn't bear it any longer, I saw a Jana Sturbach exhibition when I was showing in Barcelona and um, you know that she has sort of all sorts of mixtures of installation etc and I was really wanting to do it so in 2006 I got an Arts Council grant to make these automata which are life-size. Uh, one's in a black Victorian costume, you know a bit like Marsha and Three Sisters and it taps a metal hand and I got my mother at the age of 75 to record all, all her most significant roles. Because of course it's an ageist profession. So at the age of 75 I thought it was quite a sort of twist again to have an older woman doing all these young parts, you know, these ingenue parts. And um, you know, you have these characters that are sort of longing for Moscow, they're frustrated, you've got Miss Julie, you know, the character of Miss Julie is an amazing character, Hedda Gabler is an amazing character. These, these women, they're, they're quite Nordic, you know, from Sweden and uh, Norway and also from Russia. Um, so these automata were really, in a way, my take on the theatre. And so I'm, I'm interested in poetry too, so I work with poets. Um, I had poets respond to my paintings and I made a room in which I painted all with wallpaper with these obsessive great big flowers and had a little mouth voice coming out of the poems. So, the, 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 you know, one likes to experiment and, um, yeah, I like to work with all different aspects of, the, of, of creativity, music. My son's a composer, he composed music for one of the automata. So, um, you know, I think it's great to be open to experience and I, I you know, for so many years I was just absolutely purist about the fact that I just had to be a painter. But actually, it brings back, it feeds back into your painting. It's all about life, really.